out of the other crew, uh, Peter, uh, where are you going? Hi, Josh. Hey, He walked into the office of the senior partner, Ed Bell, and demanded his money, $2,500. But the money wasn't there. He told him it wasn't there. He'd have to come back. He said, I'm not coming back. Reached inside his pocket, pulled out a gun or shotgun or something, and started to shoot. He nicked me inside. Gunman backed out of Bell's office, shot Bell's partner, Lester Hudson, in the head, exploded a Molotov cocktail in the main law office and began hunting down secretaries, law clerks, clients, anyone in his way. Some barricaded themselves in their offices. Some climbed out on window ledges. One young woman was killed by a shotgun blast to the chest. Harrington, leaving screams and carnage and flames behind him, smashed through the glass doors of the law office and charged into the hallway. Walt Herndon was in another office on the eighth floor. He came out when he heard the shooting. A stout security guard stood frozen in the hallway, and Herndon pushed him out of the way and dropped into a crouch to duel with the gunman. I fired two or three times at him, and I, one guy went down, and that was it. In the corridor? In the corridor. And then we just crawled back in the office, and it smoked up. Is that the guy with a handgun or a shotgun? I think it was the guy with a shotgun. You hit him? I'm pretty sure he I went down. Him. He went down when I hit him. Terrified either by the approaching fire or the continued threat from the gunman, Two of the members of the law firm, including senior partner Lester Hudson, leaped from an eighth floor window ledge and were seriously injured when they hit on a roof below. For News 4 Tonight, I'm Bob Pizer. Detroit Receiving Hospital is still treating some of the victims from today's shooting. I'm Andrea Joyce. I'll have that story coming up. Police are holding 35-year-old Robert Harrington of 19,800 Huntington in connection with the shootings and fire. He is in police custody at Detroit Receiving Hospital. We don't know the nature of his injuries or his condition. Police also took into custody at the scene Harrington's brother, 36-year-old Gerald Harrington, but he was later released. Robert Harrington went to the law firm of Bell & Hudson to demand the return of a $2,500 retainer check. Harrington had reportedly hired the firm to resolve an insurance settlement for a fire at his house. When the check was not produced, Harrington pulled out a 12-gauge shotgun and opened fire. At one point, Harrington stopped shooting and exploded a Molotov cocktail he had brought in with him, setting the offices on fire. He then began shooting again. The brother, Gerald, was able to get the sawed-off shotgun from Robert, but nearly paid for it with his life. A private investigator at the scene saw Gerald with a shotgun and emptied his revolver at him. He missed him with all six shots.
The east wing of the eighth floor is completely damaged. All the other areas of the building are in good shape. So by Monday, by next week, you are saying what will be the situation? Uh, every tenant in the building, with the exception of the uh, uh, office suite that was damaged, will be back in operation 100 percent. It was a terrible experience. Uh, uh, we were fortunate that the uh, the building construction is such that the fire did not spread and the firemen uh, put it out quickly. The big problem for the dozens of office workers was the thick, dark smoke that spread quickly through the upper floors of the Buell building, smoke that caused something of a panic when workers found themselves trapped. Many were seen gasping for air from open windows. Some of the workers eventually treated at hospitals for smoke inhalation. A few office workers told newsmen that the Buell building's fire alarms malfunctions that they never went off. A charge the building management vehemently denied, and the management was supported by the Detroit Fire Department. Well, the fire alarm is, is operable. Uh, there is the hardware there that uh, is in compliance with our high-rise code. Whether it was operable, whether it was activated or not, uh, I can't tell you. I can tell you that my staff, while in the building, heard an alarm. It could have been activated either by the, the building authorities or by the, uh, the firemen there. Thirty-five-year-old Robert Harrington, the man accused of starting the chaos at the Buell building, was brought here yesterday in police custody, burned and wounded. He's in satisfactory condition now, and today he was arraigned at bedside. He was charged with six counts, the first count being uh, murder one, four assaultive counts, assault with uh, intent to commit murder. Uh, there was an arson count, and uh, there was a count of uh, uh, illegal possession of a firearm. The judge ordered Harrington held without bail. A pretrial hearing was set for June 23rd. By today, most of the 38 people brought here yesterday from the Buell building had been released. By mid-afternoon, only six people were still here, and of those, only one was in critical condition, attorney Lester Hudson. Hudson is a senior partner of former Judge Ed Bell, in whose office the shooting and firebombing began. Lester Hudson's younger brother, Joey, stayed at the hospital through the night. He says Lester still cannot talk, but is improving slowly. Uh, he's responding uh, to different things. I've asked him to move his foot. He's moving his foot. I've asked him to stop moving it. He stopped moving it. So he's responsive. Uh, he's still very critical. Uh, we still have to pray. Uh, but thank God he's gone the first 24 hours. So the worst is over now. And as Detroit Receiving's emergency room chief put it, it all could have been a lot worse. I think the rescue, uh, now that we've had time to look it over, in the sense of reflect back on it was outstanding. Uh, considering that the uh, fire department, not only in this city, but in every city in the country, can't get a hook uh, ladder higher in the eighth or ninth floor, I think the way they handled the uh, patients, the victims, by taking them up, et cetera, was just outstanding. Dr. Crome says four of the six Buell building victims should be released from the hospital within a few days, leaving only two with the prospect of a long hospital stay. I'm Peter Lewayne, News 4, Detroit Receiving Hospital.
Hundreds of family members and friends who had marveled over Eve August's promising future now came to mourn her sudden death. She was 24, pretty, talented, and excited over her new internship in Ed Bell's law office. Bell, who was slightly wounded in Friday's attack, has described her as a bright flower about to reach for the stars. It was a combined Jewish-Christian ceremony. Reverend Paul Sutton said Eve's eye was always on a goal, that she loved truth, justice, and life. And Rabbi Daniel Schwartz quoted Anne Frank, who wrote in her diary, I believe that in spite of everything, people are good at heart. Eve's parents, Herb and Elsie August, asked that any contributions be sent to a Detroit College of Law scholarship fund established in their daughter's memory. Burial was at Oakview Cemetery in Royal Oak, where Eve's fellow law students shared their feelings. We loved Eve very much. Not only was she a hard worker, but she was a, a beautiful person inside and outside. She always had a smile. She was always uh, considerate. She'd listen to everybody. She was a very vibrant individual, a lot of fun to be with. Later in the August home, Eve's mother was eager to tell people about the daughter she was so proud of. The lieutenant from the fire department came and told me how she died in the funeral home today, which really gave me peace. He said he crawled in, the room was full of smoke, Eve's heart was beating, he revived her, her eyes focused in, and he said, please don't die, you're so beautiful. And she gave him a smile, and her eyes went back, and he said she died. And she loved people, and she loved everybody. She was family. Everybody was her family. I hope that I can be like her. Roger Weber, News 4, Southfield. The Buell Building's 1,700 employees returned to work today for the first time since Friday's fiery violence to find things pretty much back to normal, except for the smell of smoke. But for many, today was also a day of questioning, wondering why there was no notification procedure or official evacuation plan carried out during the fire. The warning we had was telephone calls from co-workers in other buildings who warned us there is no effective uh, fire safety program in the building that we know of, like fire alarms, fire marshals, and things that other offices have, like the Renaissance Center, where you have programs that they, they would have to uh, assure that everyone's evacuated safely. At the end of every hallway on each floor of the Buell building is a fire hose closet. Inside a hose, a small fire extinguisher, a few feet down from there, the primary means of notifying the building people that there is a fire, it's a local telephone that connects with the, the building superintendent. It is a telephone and not an alarm, and that is what concerns many of those who work here. For there are no fire alarm warning bells in the 26-story building, and except for these small signs, none of the workers we talked to today knew of any formal fire plan or exit, except for these dark, steep stairways. The building's manager conceded that there should have been such a plan. Yes, there should be. We've been actually working with the fire department for the last several months uh, establishing a fire drill procedure. We're uh, probably just days away from a completion of that process. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was not completed. It is fortunate that the confusion of Friday's tragedy here at the Buell building didn't result in still more casualties. But the incident dramatically illustrates just how important it is to have a fire emergency plan for buildings like this, indeed, for our homes as well. Mike Wendland, News 4, Detroit. Detroit Police Sergeant Thomas Robinson said that he saw the weapon on the 8th floor of the Buell building near Robert Harrington and a second man when he arrested them June 11th. The sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun was a key piece of evidence. The prosecutor said that a gunman used it to fire four fatal shots into law clerk Eve August and wound two other people during the rampage in the law offices of attorneys Bell and Hudson. How was Mr. Harrington when you first found him? Which one? Robert. He seemed to be real dazed and uh, seemed to be uh, angry. Uh, I shouldn't say angry. I should say he was seemed to be dazed. Bleeding? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you searched him, what did you find? Uh, some shotgun shells in his pockets. 
From the witness stand, Robinson testified that Harrington was not armed when he arrested he and a second man in that smoke-filled corridor and the shotgun was on the floor. Robinson quoting the unidentified second man as saying he was only trying to stop his brother from shooting up Attorney Bell's office. Moments earlier, private investigator Walk Herndon was shot in the foot in the same hallway. Herndon also identifying Robert Harrington and a second man as being near the weapon on the floor but not armed. Defense attorney Warren Bracey Jr. and prosecutor Timothy Kenny clashed when the shotgun was admitted into evidence. Bracey saying it had not been proven the weapon was the same one that killed Eve August. But Judge John Murphy had allowed expert testimony to show that it was. Throughout the entire testimony, suspect Harrington sat quietly, head bowed, tie open, family and friends close by in the courtroom. So after two days of testimony, three witnesses have placed a smoking shotgun in Robert Harrington's hands. One witness has insisted she heard him strike a match. The hearing will continue tomorrow. At that time, Judge John Murphy must decide if Harrington should stand trial for arson, assault, and murder in the Buell Building incident. At the Murphy Hall of Justice, John Blunt, News for Detroit. Thirty-five-year-old Robert Harrington had been charged with eight offenses, including the shotgun slaying of law clerk Eve August, assaults on six people, including attorneys Ed Bell, Lester Hudson, and Saunders Dorsey, one count of arson, and one felony firearm count. The charges all grew out of the chaos at the Buell building on June 11th, when a gunman shot up the eighth-floor law offices of Ed Bell and set the place on fire. Thirty-eight people were injured. Attorneys Hudson and Dorsey were even seen falling from the windows and are still hospitalized. During the three-day preliminary court exam, Attorney Bell said that Harrington shot him after becoming agitated over a late $4,000 insurance check. Receptionist Michelle Jenkins also told of being shot by Harrington, too. Other witnesses described the panic and the fear that gripped everyone while they scrambled for cover in the law offices. Prosecutor Timothy Kenny admitted that most of his case was circumstantial, but that the weight of the evidence pointed to Harrington's guilt. But defense attorney Warren Bracey Jr. strongly disagreed, saying that nobody saw Harrington shoot Eve August, nobody saw him set the fire. And Bracey argued further that a second man was even seen holding the shotgun. Reporters learned that it was Harrington's brother who had gone to the scene to try and stop the shooting. 36th District Court Judge John Murphy listened to all of the arguments and acknowledged having problems with some of the charges, but then he bound Harrington over for a pretrial hearing on July 2nd on all eight counts. Robert Harrington's actual trial will be a long one. Just during this preliminary exam, the defense and prosecution called a total of 25 witnesses, and they are expected to call three times that many for the real trial. At the Murphy Hall of Justice, John Blunt, News for Detroit. The Buell Building. Before June 11th, that phrase simply meant a downtown office complex like all the others. Now it brings to mind an incredible human drama. <laughs> a disgruntled legal client attacked employees in the eight floor offices of prominent attorney Ed Bell. Shots killed a bright young law clerk named Eve August. More shots and a raging fire left 38 others injured. Bell gave me this startling account just after his rescue. The guy came in and asked for $2,500 and an insurance check that had not come in the mail today. Told him wasn't there, he'd have to come back. He said, I'm not coming back. Reached inside his pocket, pulled out a gun or shotgun or something and started to shoot. He nicked me in the side. Today we talked in the library of his law office, near the window where he and five others gasped for air six months ago. Mm -hmm. The fire gutted most of the eighth floor. Now the law offices have been redecorated. Though several workers are not back on the job yet, things here are returning to normal. It's business as usual. I'm not conscious about security because I just don't believe that you can go through life being afraid, and, and so I refuse to do that. And apparently that attitude has prevailed in this office because nobody else up here seems to be that concerned about security. Law clerks Athena Sopralis and Maria Miller worked in the library today just as they did June 11th. Like Ed Bell, they made a terrifying climb to safety. After climbing out on a ladder eight floors above the ground, you have to come away thinking, I can handle a lot of other problems in life. Oh, you certainly realize that you have the strength inside of you that, that you pull out at that time. And as we were all sitting up here, I have to, you know, I really have to say that we were all very brave. I think when you almost die with people, you become a lot closer to them. You have a lot more insight to, and a lot more respect for how they handle crisis situations. 
In the middle of the gunfire, attorneys Saunders, Dorsey, and Lester Hudson jumped out of these windows on the north side of the building. They were critically hurt and are still not back on the job. They fell to a roof 40 feet below. Dorsey is recovering from spinal injuries. Hudson, seen here last May, today told News 4, I'm recuperating well. A lot of people help support me, and I've never lost faith. The Buell Building fire will be remembered for heroes as well as victims. Firemen had to splice a 20-foot extension to the main ladder. Captain Frank Liss supervised that effort. He and many of his colleagues have been honored for their work that day. Well, I was fortunate enough to uh, help in the rescue of uh, those people, and which saved some lives, which uh, I feel proud in doing. Police Sergeant Tommy Robinson received a medal yesterday for his arrest of suspect Robert Harrington, whose trial begins January 10th. Robinson says he was thinking about death, not heroism. I can imagine the headlines being the next day, these are the last photos of the officer killed in the line of duty. It was a story of terror and tragedy and heroism, the kind of story the occupants of the Buell building and their rescuers will never forget. And as they look back on the events of June 11, 1982, they can be consoled by one thought. It could have been a lot worse. Roger Weber, News 4, Detroit. We have to hear about the murder and hear uh, all over again. It's it's like living the tragedy all over again. For 14 years, the tragedy has lurked in a mother's nightmares. Now it returns to a Detroit courtroom. June 11, 1982, a mentally ill man brings flames and gunfire to the Buell building. I had a beautiful daughter for 24 years. I thought she was going to be the first female president. She was a third year law student. She was gorgeous. She was, she was every um, mother's dream. Eve August was an intern in the law offices of Bell and Hudson. A disgruntled client named Robert Harrington murdered August, wounded others, and set a fire. Lawyer Saunders Dorsey hid in an office, but the smoke poured in. There was a lot of smoke. In. I thought at that time that I probably would uh, die from the smoke inhalation. Dorsey tried to get to a ledge one floor beneath him, but fell 60 feet to a lower roof. Just lying there in, um, in excruciating pain has never been, I, I, I had no idea the extent of the, uh, the, the pain from uh, that fall. And uh, probably the next worst thing that I remember is just being in the hospital. Uh, told that you would never walk again about three days later. A jury convicted Harrington of first-degree murder. Saunders Dorsey and Elsie August thought they would never see him again. But the Michigan Court of Appeals ruled the jury instructions included one wrong word. The trial judge said or when she should have said and. The higher court ruled that mistake interfered with Harrington's insanity defense. One word and, and he gets a new trial? Uh... No, I'm totally dismayed. It was totally premeditated. He rode on the bus for an hour, totally armed, with a sawed-off shotgun and gasoline, and comes in and shoots a few people, murders my daughter. Harrington's brother tells the Newsbeat that was not him. He was mentally ill. He can't remember what happened. He prays for the victims. Saunders Dorsey says Harrington's act was despicable, but as for the new trial, so be it. I do understand, you know, he's got constitutional rights just like anybody else. And, um, justice prevailed last time. I'm hopeful that it, it happens again. On December 2nd, Robert Harrington will get his second chance, and the victims will face the painful memories. In Detroit, Roger Weber, Nightbeat.